श्याम वृंदावन धाम की जय नवदीप मायापुर धाम की जय गंगा देवी की जय यमुनामयी की जय भक्ति देवी की जय तुलसी रानी की जय समवेत भक्त वृंद की जय श्री हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद् भागवतम की जय इस्कॉन बीवी थी संस्थापक आचार्य श्री गोपाल की जय गो प्रेमानंदे ओ गौरी श्री समुद्र गौरी All glories to some of the devotees. 
All glory to some of the devotees. All glory to Sri Sri Guru and Gauranga. Jai Shri Rupa. Om Jnana Timinanta Sya Jnana Jana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Putale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yudaparakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Shcha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sagana Raghunatham Vitam Tam Sajeevam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitam Shcha E Krishna Karuna Simtho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesh Gopika Kant Radha Kant Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Prishabhano Sute Devi Pranamami Hare Priye Vanchakalpatar Pyascha Kripa Sintu Pyaivacha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Avritam Jnana Metena Jnani no Nitya Vairna Kama Rupena Kanteya Dushpure Nana Lena Cha Avritam Jnana Metena Jnani no Nitya Vairna Kama Rupena Kanteya Tushpure Nana Lena Cha Avritam Jnana Vetena Jnani no Nitya Vairna Kama Rupena Kanteya Tushpure Nana Lena Cha Avritam Jnana Metena Jnani no Nitya Vairna Kama Rupena Kanteya Tushpure Nana Lena Cha Avritam Jnana Metena Jnani no Nitya Vairna Kama Rupena Kanteya Tushpure Nana Lena Cha Avritam Jnana Metena Jnani no Nitya Vairna Kama Rupena Kanteya Tushpure Nana Lena Cha Avritam Jnana Metena Jnani no Nitya Vairna Kama Rupena Kanteya Tushpure Nana Lena Cha Avritam Jnana Metena Jnani no Nitya Vairna 
कामूपेन कौंतेय दुष्पूरेनानवेन च आवृत कवर्ड ज्ञान प्योर कॉन्शियसनेस एतेन बाय दिस ज्ञानिन ऑफ द नोवर नित्य वैवेणा बाय द इटर्नल एनमी काम रूपेण इन द फॉर्म ऑफ लास्ट कौंतेय ओ सन ऑफ कुंती दुष्पूरेण never to be satisfied analena by the fire cha also translation thus the wise living entities pure consciousness becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust which is never satisfied and which burns like fire please repeat thus the wise living entities pure consciousness becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust which is never satisfied and which burns like fire purport by his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami shri prabhupad ki jai it is said in the manusmriti that lust cannot be satisfied by any amount of sense enjoyment just as fire is never extinguished by a constant supply of fuel in the material world the center of all activities is sex and thus this material world is called maithunya agara or the shackles of sex life in the ordinary prison house criminals are kept within bars similarly the criminals who are disobedient to the laws of the lord are shackled by sex life advancement of material civilization on the basis of sense gratification means increasing the duration of the material existence of a living entity therefore this lust is the symbol of ignorance by which the living entity is kept within the material world while one enjoys sense gratification it may be that there is some feeling of happiness but actually that so called feeling of happiness is the ultimate enemy enemy of the sense enjoyer madgavira bigopala swikuryat kripaya yadi tadaiva sampaya hapitwa hrishye yustat priya janah the wise man's knowledge of his natural awareness or gyan regarding the self is covered by his enemy acting as lust and ramanuja charja in his commentary on bhagavad gita gita bhashya he gives two reasons for this one is that this lust remains insatiable because it is vishaya vyamoha janana it generates bewilderment through sense gratification anyone who has ever deliberately indulged in sense gratification you've experienced it produces bewilderment and that cannot be satisfying and the second reason that this lust is dushpura according to ramanuja charja is dushpurena purti anarha vishayena analena that is to say that it's not really worth fulfilling these desires for sense gratification it's all for not and in that way also it remains unfulfillable we can say dushpura you you can't 
it, it's insatiable. You can't satisfy it. Madhvacharya says that even immediate knowledge of God, that is to say, knowledge that you've heard from your spiritual master, if it's acquired by Shastra, it still cannot shine from your person or within your heart as long as it is encrusted by kama, lust. Even in the case of jnanis, the, the, the person that we're talking about in this verse is jnaninaha, of the jnani. It doesn't say of the ordinary person. It doesn't even say of those who have a little bit of jnani. It means a jnani, a wise man, someone who knows all the shastras. And so then what to speak of those of us who don't really know much of anything, those of us who maybe we've heard something from the spiritual master and maybe we're trying to repeat what we've heard without the adequate realization. What to speak of ourselves. So we can become bewildered, this is the point. And for this reason, the Prabhupada always prodded his disciples, read these books every day. The books are not just for selling. They're not just for distributing to others. They're for reading, for our own edification, because it's surprising how quickly we can be covered over by our desires. Now, lust is defined in different ways. According to Merriam-Webster's English Dictionary, lust primarily means intense desire of a sexual nature. But secondarily, lust also means a strong wish for something. Just like we sometimes hear it said, this person has a lust for politics, <laughs> or he has a lust for life, a great enthusiasm. So a third meaning that is given in the dictionary is an urgent desire or interest in something. Just like you may have an urgent need to eat some sweets, emergency. Sometimes it happens. So, these are all bona fide definitions of lust. Back in Bhagavad Gita, well, two verses ago, you may recall, probably somebody explained, Baladevita Bhushan explained, Mahashana. Anybody remember what is Mahashana? Yeah. Well, what does it mean? Mahashana, what does it mean? He eats everything. He wants to eat, big eater, <laughs> likes to eat everything. So lust eats up this whole world, and lusty people would also like to eat the whole world up if they could. And that's why the Shastra holds us in check with what? Shastra conjunctions. Let's put all this in context. What chapter are we in? We're in chapter 3. Chapter 3 is entitled what? Karma Yoga. What does Karma Yoga mean? It means your Krishna is encouraging Arjun first and foremost to become nishkama. How do you become nishkama? By doing what someone else wants, not by doing what you want. And the Shastra is the ultimate authority. Shastra Yonitvat. Don't follow someone else's instructions or desires if that person is not representing what the Shastra enjoins. So everything is coming from Shastra ultimately. So if we don't allow ourselves to be governed by Shastra, what does Shastra mean actually? Something that disciplines us. Shastatu. Shast. Shastari we discussed the other day. So it's a person who holds the weapons. Just like here we have monkeys. We've been noticing lately, the guards are walking around with langur because <laughs> it's hard to keep the monkeys in check without a langur. You have a stick, that's okay. Once I was in the MVT park and five guards plus myself, all of us armed with sticks, were not able to pacify an agitated monkey who was ready to attack all five of us at once. 
It happens sometimes. You know, this is the nature of animals. Animal means cannot control the lust. I saw this yesterday, as a matter of fact, on top of another apartment holder's flat. On the roof, there were maybe a dozen monkeys all fighting at once. And one monkey was growling at the monkey on the other roof. But he had time to hop onto a, a third monkey and start enjoying his genital at the same time that he's growling at another monkey. Is this where we want to go? Think about it. Mahashana, if you, if, you, if you feed lust, then this is what it will do. It will keep eating until there's nothing left. And Krishna says this is how we spiral down the vortex into the lower species of life. Not only lower species of life, but he says into hellish species of life later on in Bhagavad Gita. So this is the whole context of this discussion about lust. Arjun raised a question, what, you know, I want to follow all these rules and regulations, that's fine, uh, intellectually, it's, I'm okay with that. But, you know, sometimes it just feels like I'm impelled or compelled to, to do something else. So well, why is that? And Krishna says, Kama Esha, Krodha Esha, you've already heard. So Vishnu, uh, I'm sorry, Baladeva Dabhushan explaining Mahashana, he says, you cannot give it what it wants. And then he quotes the Smriti Shastra. If all that is available on the earth in the form of food and money and cars and women and everything is not enough for one person, then you should think about this and try to, try to go about with a peaceful mind. Iti madva shamam varajet. He's quoting from Mahabharata, Anushasan Parva. Chapter 13, you might have heard that the other day. So, monkeys, we're talking about monkeys. The mind is a monkey. And unless you live in Vrindavan, it's not so easy to understand or appreciate just what is the character of a monkey. But when you live here, you understand very clearly what is the character of a monkey. There are four ways to deal with an enemy. Enemy meaning somebody who is acting against your interests. The best thing you can do is try to be reconciliatory. That's called sama. You try to pacify the person with all reasonable civil arguments. Sometimes that doesn't work. So if that doesn't work, you have to look for some other options. What are your other options? Dana, you can bribe the person. This is what we do in India, isn't it? And everybody knows. Anything legal or illegal can be done here if you have enough money and are ready to offer it. That's just the way it is. Dana. If that doesn't work, then you have to create politics. I hope there are no Bengalis here. I'm going to tell a Bengali joke. You can insert the ethnic group of your choice, but it works well with Bengalis. One Bengali is a poet. Two Bengalis are a political party. Three Bengalis are two political parties. And anything more than that is, of course, Durga Puja. But the point is that people divide and rule. You, you, if you can't bribe your enemy, if you can't pacify your enemy, then you have to at least divide your enemy so that he's not so formidable. That's politics. Some people have a lust for politics, as we said. And then finally, if nothing else works, then what do you have to do? War. Danda. And this is the point about monkeys. And we've already mentioned, sometimes even a danda doesn't work. Even you have to get the langur on me, because he can rip those little guys to shreds. So, this is how the mind has to be dealt with. Never ever trust the mind, we're, we're told in the fifth canto. Never leave it for a second. Do not leave it unsupervised, do not trust it, do not try to cajole it or try to bribe it or convince it. It will not work. The mind is contaminated with lust. We were describing the definitions of lust. Sexual, that is obvious. Uh, the whole world, Prabhupada says, is going around on the basis of that. Strong impulse, very difficult to, to control also. But anything you want, and people want so many things, desires in general. This is Kama also. 
In Sanskrit, it's not such a hard and fast uh, distinction made. Any kind of desire, it's ultimately lust, but there are many different kinds of desires. Even in English, the word lust doesn't always just mean sexual. So, this is, uh, this is what Baladevi Dabhushan had said about the nature of lust, which is all devouring, sinful enemy of those world. Why enemy? This is the theme of the commentators on today's verse. The theme is that they're addressing is this question, why do you call lust an enemy? So we should listen carefully now. Madhvacharya is telling us, even if you have gyan that you have heard, and maybe not realized, but you faithfully heard, you're a bona fide kanishta adhikari, or even a madhyam adhikari, You've heard from your spiritual master and you may not have fully realized, but you have faith. Even then you can be bewildered by lust, by <coughs> desire that captivates the intelligence. The, the enemy is already sitting in strategic locations when in our mind-body complex. In the intelligence, in the senses, like this. So Kama Rupa means why is it an eternal foe, nitya vairi? One reason is that it's insatiable. What is the word here used for insatiable? Avritam jnanam etena jnani no nitya vairina. What else? Kamarupena kaunteya dushpurena analena cha. Two words are used actually, dushpura and anala. Analam, analam. What does analam mean? Am tor par agho bolte hain, yagni. But another Sanskrit word is analam. What does analam mean actually? Analam. Alam means enough. Kafi. Analam means it's not enough. Dushpurena analena cha. No matter how much you give it, it's not enough because it cannot be fulfilled. Dushpura. Dushpura, you can say, means it's difficult to fulfill, but actually the fact of the matter, according to what we've already heard from Ramanuja Acharya and also from Madhva Acharya, it cannot be fulfilled. So this is an important thing. Even if you get the post of Indra, what happens then? Then you start thinking about, you know, if only I was Lord Brahma. And Brahma is thinking, you know, if only this Krishna, you know, he's causing problems, if we can get rid of him. <laughs> this is the problem. We, we, would be, we would be prepared to eat up even Krishna. So then, uh, Madhvacharya quotes a, a very nice verse from the Smriti Shastras. He says, Jnanasya Brahmanas Chagner Dhumo Buddhir Malam Tatha Adarsha Yasyata Jivasya we heard this in yesterday's verse. There are three kinds of different levels of covering, no? So dust covering a mirror, Srila Prabhupada has also explained this. That's like the person in Sattva Guna. He's, you know, he's a conditioned soul, but he's relatively civil and he's got knowledge to some degree. Like, a, like dust covering your mirror. You can still see that there's a reflection. Sometimes a mirror becomes so covered with dust after many years or decades, you don't even know it's a mirror. You think it's some kind of big board. It's so covered with glass, it's not even recognizable as such. That can happen. That's the next level. Dhumo buddhir malam tatha. As the smoke is covering the fire of intelligence. The fire, when the, when the fire of lust is burning, the fire of intelligence cannot shine. This is the point of Madhvacharya's commentary. Naprakajate. So, And when we're overwhelmed by lust, then it's like a, a, an embryo within the womb, thoroughly covered, no, no scope of communicating or perceiving the outside world at all. Kama. So, modes of goodness, modes of passion, modes of ignorance are like this. Successive layers of covering. So, 
Sridhar Swami has also given us commentary. He says here what was referred to as Idam, and back in text uh, 37, this, this enemy, Mahashana, it's clearly shown to be inimical. Inimical means it's an enemy, make no mistake about it. It destroys discriminate knowledge. For a fool, certainly lust is just a cause of happiness when he's enjoying. But the problem is that later on it turns into animosity because it bites back. Especially sinful activity. If you, if in an effort to enjoy material sense gratification, if you violate the injunctions of Shastra, then you get a more severe reaction. But you always get a reaction. Even if you're pious, you will get the reaction. Do you, this is why even Indra has to suffer. Even Brahma suffers. Even the people, those deities that are worshipped by materialistic persons, they're all suffering, actually. They're all conditioned souls. And they're all infected to one degree or another by lust, and they're all covered by that lust to one degree or another as well. So that's one thing. And then another thing Sri Swami mentions is that even though plied with sense gratification, this lust remains unsatisfied. So therefore it's called an enemy because also it causes shoka and santapa. This is why we compare it to fire. Fire, what does fire do? Does it make you cool? No. Fire burns. And so does lust. You get burned. Sometimes we have this. So, nowadays they have this. People are romantic scams <laughs> on the internet. They cultivate someone long distance by creating a fraudulent identity and the person falls in love and then you know listen I need some money can you send some money and they send larger and larger amounts of money don't get any bright ideas people <laughs> but this happens so they get burnt so it's an eternal enemy nobody nobody really forces you to indulge in lust but once you do then you get burnt Therefore, it's an enemy, according to Sridhar Swami. Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur also says, the, this verse explains that lust is only nothing but the ignorance of the jiva. And that's the definition of ignorance, is that it covers your knowledge. That's what we're talking about here, in these three ways that we've mentioned already. So, eternal enemy means that this lust should be killed only. You cannot bargain with it. You can't strike a deal with it. You can't pacify it. You can't bribe it. You cannot divide it. You, even beating it will not work. You have to kill it. This is very clear in his commentary. Let's see what the Sanskrit is, he says. Um, Anyway, Baladi Vidabhushan says much the same. Uh, well, first of all, Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur. says that he's quoting from Srimad Bhagavatam, ninth canto, chapter 19, text number 14, which says, Najatu Kama Kama Nam Upapoke Nasham Yati. Avisha Krishna Vart Meva Puya Eva Bhivarthade. As supplying butter to the fire does not diminish the fire but instead increases it more and more, the endeavor to stop lusty desires by continual enjoyment can never be successful. Enough said. Baladyavidya Bhushan quotes exactly the same verse. He was, after all, trained by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, so he's representing his Guru Janas quite well. And we know that Baladi Vidabhushan was also trained in the Madhva Sampradaya, so his commentary also faithfully represents the exact same things that we've already heard today from Madhvacharya. Just as Srila Prabhupada's purports also 
paraphrase or quote or reiterate the same points that are made by his predecessors. This is the Guru Parampara system. So he says this verse is clarifying what Krishna intends to say here. The knowledge of the living entity, the jiva, Knowledge of the living entity who is called Jnani. He says this Jnani refers to any jiva. Gya, what does Jnana mean? Gya actually means awareness or pure consciousness. So everybody has Jnana. If you're, if you're sentient, if you're awake, if you're conscious, you can be called a Jnani in a very general sense. So apparently that's how he's taking it. But this knowledge of the jiva is covered by its eternal enemy, Nitya Vairi. Vairi. Vair. Somebody who's envious, actually, is what it means. In the form of lust, Kama Rupena. For the ignorant person, Kama is a friend because it gives happiness at the time of enjoying sense objects. This is how the politicians exploit stupid people. And we see worldwide this is what they do. You just have to drown them in sense gratification, they'll agree to anything you say because they can't think straight. Why? Because their intelligence is covered by lust for the things that they desire out of ignorance. So primary objective of any politician or even big corporate magnet is to keep people in ignorance. The last thing you're going to be encouraged to do by a politician is to read Srila Prabhupada's books, for sure. And the only reason they read them is to know how to deal with people who read them. <laughs> But this is the point. For the ignorant person, Kama it seems like a friend, but actually it's the enemy because its ultimate effect is suffering. But the person in knowledge knows that even at the time of enjoyment, it will also be a cause of suffering. Therefore, it's called a constant enemy. Nitya Vairi, he says, means it's <laughs> at any stage of the process, this lust has, has no interest in your own welfare. That's an enemy. Somebody who has no interest in your welfare and is working against it constantly, that person can be called an Nityavairi. Lust is like that. You have to control your own. Nobody else can do it for you, and nothing will happen until you do. In terms of advancement in spiritual life. So th that's why the charges are emphasizing here this is an enemy, make mis no mistake about it. This lust is not your friend. Therefore, this means, Baldevida Bhushan reiterates, that by all means it should be destroyed. He says the same thing as Vishnat Chakravarti Thakur. Tasmat sarvatha hantavya iti bhava. Tasmat sarvatha hantavya iti bhava. The idea here is that in every way, at all times, in all circumstances, this thing should simply be killed. Hanta. Hanyate. That doesn't mean you should harm it or you should discipline it or imprison it. Kill it. <laughs> Very unmistakable. Okay, so the person in knowledge knows that even at the time of enjoyment, this thing will become his enemy. It's always his enemy, rather. Therefore, by all means, it should be killed. Moreover, it's unsatiable, like fire. Just as it's impossible to satisfy a fire with ghee, what to speak of gasoline or any other fuel. Kama cannot be satisfied even by enjoyment. And then he quotes the same verse. So the conclusion is that Kama is our eternal enemy. Now, I don't know about you people, but I found it very uh, enlivening what we heard this morning from His Holiness Radharaman Swami Maharaj. So much so that I'm going to reiterate this section of the Bhagavatam, 10, 20, 37, and 8. The fish swimming in an increasingly, sh in increasingly shallow water don't understand that that water is diminishing in a puddle. He said lake this morning, but what we, the word is actually puddle. After the rainy season, which we're still awaiting, the puddles are everywhere, and you, sometimes you see the little tiny, tiny frogs in the MVT. The whole place roars at night with the 
collective shouting of so many frogs <laughs> inviting the snake of death. And they don't realize that some of them are, are trapped in these little puddles that are going to dry up when the sun comes out. And they don't realize that in exactly the same way that so many people in this world set up their little puddles very comfortably and they don't see that the season is changing and this puddle is definitely going to dry up and <laughs> hey did you notice it's getting hot in here <laughs> global warming this is the next verse just as a miserly poverty stricken person overly absorbed in family life suffers because he can't control his senses the fish swimming in the shallow water have to suffer the heat of the autumn sun as a puddle is drying up it's also heating up because the water is getting less and less and the sun is getting more and more. It is such an apt analogy for our own condition right now in 2022. Even without global warming, which I think we're all feeling, what was it last week, 49 I think, <laughs> degrees. I, even if it weren't for that, still this world it just seems like it's becoming increasingly uncomfortable for many reasons for many many reasons mostly stemming from this Mahashana Nitya Vairi Vairitva uh, the eternal enemy of lust so we're like that we're in a shrinking pond and we don't recognize that we've only got a limited limited time to do something about it and it's going to be, get increasingly more and more uncomfortable so that much we simply have to tolerate this is exactly what Krishna is telling Arjuna elsewhere in the Gita and four things he mentioned in particular that make it really difficult if you're a householder you're, you're not, you don't have money Kripana because you're associated with the energy of enjoying and the, and the goal of enjoying, you become very small-minded and miserly. Kutumba, you've got a big family to support, it's a problem. And on top of everything else, as if you didn't have enough problems, a vegetarian. You've not even controlled your senses also, which probably means there are more kids coming as well, which just compounds the problem. So this is the, this is the situation for the householders, for the materialistic householders in this material world. And this verse, it, it kind of fits, speaks to their predicament. Avrutam jnanam etenan jnani no nitta vairana ityadi. So these are a few things we can speak about. This famous verse from Bhagavad Gita, the whole passage is famous. But if anybody has any questions or any comments, we can maybe discuss because we have a few minutes left. Avritam jnana metena jnani no nitya vairana kamalu rupena kantea dushpura analena cha. The wise living entities, pure consciousness becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and which burns like fire. Any questions? Yes, or would you? Okay, I, ask, I think you're asking that we can't pacify or bribe or you know, weaken or in any way deal with lust other than killing it. So, but at the same time, our desires are natural to us. We can't repress them either. So what do we do? Is that what you're asking? Very good question. This is why I mentioned that we have to take this instruction here at the end of chapter 3 in the entire context of chapter 3 in which Krishna is trying to convince Arjuna to do what? 
What is he trying to convince Arjun to do? Fight. And why fight? Because that happens to be Arjuna's dharma, swadharma. I mean, actually, Krishna's ultimately going to take it to a higher level by pointing out that the only, that the, the active ingredient of your swadharma, so to speak, is pure, pure bhakti, surrender. But at this stage of the conversation, he's just trying to get Arjun to perform his duty. And Arjun's specific duty is to fight as a kshatriya. Every one of us has a particular duty to perform. A housewife has something she has to do. Prabhupada says, gives the example. Apropos example at this time of the year. She has to cook in the kitchen. <laughs> Even though it's the hottest part of the year. And similarly, a person in the month of Magh also has to go and bathe in the river. Nowadays, that's largely been obviated because we have water piped into the apartments. But the point is that you have to do your duty. Prahlad Maharaj says elsewhere in the Bhagavatam, you can conquer over desires for sense gratification by disciplining your senses very strictly. And on what basis do you discipline your senses? Well, Krishna says in the end of chapter 3, tasmat chastram pramanam te karya karya vivasthitao. You should decide what you're going to do and what you're not going to do based on what the Shastra enjoins. And if the Shastra enjoins to do this, then you don't do that, you do this. So it's very straightforward and it's very easy, but because our desires are stronger, therefore the, the desires kind of push the intelligence out of the way momentarily, and we begin to rationalize and you know, reinterpret and misinterpret and just outright ignore the things that we don't like to hear. That's the problem. And that's why Krishna's special mercy incarnation comes in the form of the bona fide spiritual master. Because you can't do that with him. In the temple, Krishna will always be smiling and playing a flute. No matter what nonsense you do, he's still smiling. But the spiritual master is going to call you a nonsense. More often than not. Because it's his duty. Spare the rod, spoil the child, as they say in English. So, the short answer to your question is that we control our senses by engaging our desires in accordance with the injunctions of Shastra under the guidance of the bona fide spiritual master. And that fits right in the general mood of this chapter in which Krishna is emphasizing this point. Let me, let me just read something that's very significant here in this chapter also that hopefully should make this very clear. I just read this last night. I'm going to just look at text 16, wherein Krishna says, My dear Arjun, one who does not follow in human life the cycle of sacrifice thus established by the Vedas, he's talking about dharma, certainly leads a life full of sin. Living only for the satisfaction of the senses, such a person lives in vain. And Srila Prabhupada has given us a very fine purport here, he says, the mammonist philosophy of work very hard and enjoy sense gratification is condemned herein by the Lord. Therefore, for those who want to enjoy this material world, the above-mentioned cycle of performing yajnas is absolutely necessary. One who does not follow such regulations is living a very risky life, being condemned more and more. By nature's law, this human form is specifically meant for self-realization in either of three ways. So that you have three bona fide options. Listen to them. Jnana, uh, sorry, uh, karma yoga, jnana yoga, or bhakti yoga. There's no necessity of rigidly following the performances of the yajnas for the transcendentalists who are above vice and virtue. But those who are engaged in sense gratification require purification by the above-mentioned cycle of yajna performances. There are different kinds of activities. Those who are not Krishna conscious are certainly engaged in sensory consciousness. Therefore, they need to execute pious work. The yajna system is planned in such a way that sensory conscious persons may satisfy their desires without becoming entangled in the reaction. 
The prosperity of the world depends not on our own efforts, but on the background arrangement of the Supreme Lord, directly carried out by the demigods. You're acting in harmony with this cosmic plan if you engage in your prescribed duties. And you're causing problems if you don't. That's the take home message here. Indirectly, it is the practice of Krishna consciousness because when one masters the performance of yajnas, one is sure to become Krishna conscious. But if by performing yajnas one does not become Krishna conscious, such principles are counted only as moral codes. One should not therefore limit his progress only to the point of moral codes, but should transcend them to attain Krishna consciousness. So the point is that at this stage of the discussion, chapter three, the emphasis is on karma yoga and attaining a nishkama bhava by performing your own prescribed duty without tr attempting someone else's prescribed duty or ignoring your own. And that purifies the heart such that when we hear from the spiritual master, we actually can assimilate properly without twisting and twangling it into something else. Is that okay? Long answer for a simple question. Anyone else have any? Yes? Not surprising, is it? Well, I, I'm not in a position to comment on. I mean, I'm not an Islamic scholar for one thing, but uh, these days it can cause a lot of riots if you criticize Islam. <laughs> so, you know, the point is that there are there's the same the same essential process of becoming selfless and surrendering to God is, is found in every society, every country, practically speaking, in the world except for the Far East. Even in Japan they have some notion like demigods, but not above that. The poor Chinese just seem to lose out all the time. Mokasha, Moka Karmano, Moka Gyana Vicheta Sahadaksha, Sima Surim Chaiva, Ityadi. But for the most part, people and everyone in the, in the world has some idea of God. And there's uh, some scriptures that are meant for them. And obviously, you can only give a person what they're ready to handle. It's described as Shraddhane, what is that? In the Padma Purana, if you try to give instructions that are over the Adhikar level of an audience, then that they're going to become offensive. And you're just watering offenses, which is not good also. So these different scriptures, according to time, place, and circumstance, and these different prophets and messiahs and whatnot, they're giving according to what people in their locale and in that time can handle. And it will purify them if they're acting in good faith. But uh, yeah, a lot of the time what we see is that the whole, pro the whole tradition can become contaminated as well. And I would expect that there's a lot of interpolation there. Like this 72 versions idea for one thing, my God. <laughs> what, what, I mean, you know, it's really just gross. I didn't, pardon me for saying it so bluntly, but... You know, and we, the, the, here's another thing. This is why we're emphasizing in the beginning of the class the importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books because we can become as confused as they are. As, do we think we have any greater adhikar to start with? No. Only because we're hearing every day, only because we're following the instructions that we hear in good faith, that then we're making some advancement and we can see things clearly. Once you stop following the process, all bets are off. You, you can say and do anything. That's the scary thing. So, this is why the charges are warning us that this desire, I'm going to put it in general terms, our desires in general, this is the enemy. You cannot compromise with an enemy. You have to really be pretty firm with an enemy. 
demonstrate an enemy. Nitya vairina means a constant enemy. At, at no time is this lust not an enemy, which is why you cannot trust it. This is the postulation with which we accept the injunctions of the Shastra. It's, it's assumed in Vedic tradition that everyone is a criminal. There are people in society who like to be very, I mean, liberal is okay, but uh, naive. <laughs> and think, you know, everybody's all good and everything, but actually this, you know, innately we have this pure nature, but as long as we're conditioned souls, we're all criminals. And this has to be recognized practically in terms of our actions. Therefore we said, Krishna said, tasmat chastram pramanam te karya karya vijanataha. You have to discriminate what to do and what not to do based on what you're told in the Shastra. Guru Sadhu Shastra. Narutam Das Thakur said, Guru Sadhu Shastra Vakya Chite Te Kuriya Aikya. All three of them saying the same thing. We have to surrender only. Okay? All right. Time is up. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.